That's the shittiest reveal ever. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I, uh, I got this stupid um, uh, Twitch thing that allows me to have horrible backgrounds. So I'm hoping that uh, uh, every time I do this, I can have a more and more horrible one. I saw one the other day with, um, with uh, unicorns, and so I was going to do that one too. And I got to change my lighting. Woo! Look at that. Whoa! Wait. Almost. Huh? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's like all oh, cool. Hey guys, how you doing? It's been a while, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, drinking coffee. Uh, burping. It has been so busy. Holy cow. I have been uh I've been more busy during this whole lockdown thing, if you want to look at it that way, uh than uh I was prior, and I was busy before, too. So, I wanted to say hi, and uh, start with a couple of things here. Okay, so, the, okay, first off, I haven't been on Twitch because I have been relentlessly mixing. So, I'm in the middle of, uh, so the, the Roundhouse DVD, uh, the one that I filmed with the Volume 1 band, is, today is the last day for it, so... I sent the mix to mastering yesterday, but it's like a two-hour concert, so it's just a huge amount of material, and uh, uh, we finally signed off on the visuals, and I got the artwork, and I got the credits done, and so this afternoon I make the 5.1 version of the Roundhouse mix, um, and then I've got a couple more things to do to sort of figure that one out, and then that's it, but also there was two documentaries that we made for that, which was a huge amount of work, and... Um, the next thing is uh, I've got these three streaming concerts coming up. Uh, the first one is, it's man, it's with the four people in different locations. And uh, uh, we're going to do it on Stage It. And I'm putting tickets up later this week. It's uh, it's cost a lot of money to do, so I, I hate to have to um, try and sell it. But I have to. But it's worth it. It's going to be great. Uh, and then i got two other concerts after that. I've been writing uh, parents, uh, you know, kids, life. Holy crap, man. It's been crazy. So uh, that's my reason why I haven't been on Twitch. I apologize. But I hope that my my shitty um, my shitty background makes up for it. All right. Uh, I see what you're writing here. There's a couple of questions. Uh, but I've got a bunch of questions here, too. Um, all right. So uh, what's next? Okay. So podcasts yes i uh i put up a guitar improvisation yesterday um and people saying that there's no yes. guitars being heard the whole thing is guitar it's just all floaty guitar which i'm so much more into right hey thanks man thanks for the donation dude Woo! <laughs> um all right all right so the podcast uh the next one is supposed to be alien and i just haven't wanted to do it that's my reason for not doing it. I just haven't wanted to do it. It just seems like, oh my God, this. Plus, I think when I first started doing the podcast as well, there was a certain faction of uh, the audience or whatever that thought that I was putting them up because I was uh, uh, trying to uh, basically rationalize some sort of hyper intense uh, form of self absorption into trying to get validation for it. But honestly, I feel that now more than ever, the whole idea of what I'm trying to do creatively hinges on me being able to sort of uh, take stock of the past and sort of analyze um, where I have been. And the podcast helped me for that. But man, Alien was just such a motherfucker of a time that the idea of going into it, it just I'm every day that I sit down and open up that session, the podcast session to start, I'm just like, yeah, nah. And I go do something else. But I will be brave and I shall do it. But not yet. <laughs> but not yet. Some gladiator style shit there. Okay, so the DVDs. Okay, all that is groovy. I've got my coffee. This is my favorite coffee cup, actually. It's plastic, and I got given it to me in Serbia by a, uh, I think it's a radio station in Alaska, and it's called uh, Tundra Struck. It says, You wanted second best, you've got it. That's my favorite cup. So, makes the coffee taste better. I'd love to see a story 
or hear the story of my appearance with Jay Leno, Jay Leno on Vi back in the day. Ah, yes, that old chestnut of me sticking things in my ass. You see, I often look at the idea of a 50-year-old man uh, or 48-year-old man sticking things in his ass as just really predatory versus a 22-year-old man sticking things in his ass, which is what I was when I stuck Jay Leno's phone in my ass when I was 22. But that's neither here nor there. Okay, so I'm going to stop. Uh, okay, got a whole bunch of questions here, but you see, I've got my, my iPod here, and it's got all your questions. See, these are your questions. Yay. Future. Oh, someone's texting me. Who's that? My Twitch code. Hmm. Future. All right, so here we go, answering some questions. That's how I'm going to start today, and uh, and then we'll just take it piece by piece. I got a new guitar someone sent to me. This company, Aristides, sent me a guitar. And although the Stormbender, uh, my famous guitar, is uh, perfect for me, and I have zero reason to not use it, um, like any musician, I like toys. And Aristides sent me this really, really cool guitar, so I've been playing that. Um, and I'll play it here, too. All right, so questions here. Where are we at? This needs to be a movie, it says. Form it in the way of a question. Okay. Have you ever thought about doing a Ghost 2-ish type ambient metal album? I did uh, a Ghost 2 album, and I actually did a cover for it as well. Uh, but I think the biggest thing that I find on my creative uh, uh, trajectory is when I get into something, that's all I want to do. And it's as easy for me to fall out of love with a project as it is for me to fall in love with a project. So oftentimes, you've, you've been following me for years, you may uh, find that uh, I will um, announce something on Twitter. I'll be like, oh, I'm doing a record, it's all bass, or it's all, you know, Tibetan choirs and a zither or something. And then they never hear about it again. It's because when I'm in that frame of mind where that seems like really interesting to me, that's all I want to do. But then the wind shifts and then I change my mind. And so that goes to idea. I started it. I got bored of it. Didn't like it. Went on to something else. Oh, I have an idea. I had an idea. And I'm so psyched on this right now. Amidst all the work of which there's so much... I want to make a I want to make a musical instrument. So I've got this idea for a musical instrument that is bizarre. It's like super bizarre. Um, but I don't want to talk about it yet. I'm, I've I've looked up. I've got a couple people that uh, I've talked to about making DSP, and then, but it's this combination of like MIDI and lights and uh, and sound and microphone and ambience and echoes, and it's this beautiful box. Um, I, I think I was going to, I think the name that springs to mind is a resonome, like G N O M E. It's like a little gnome that resonates, which when I say it like that it sounds super not interesting, but when I do figure it out, uh, it's dude, it's going to be so weird and so niche and it's probably going to cost people a thousand bucks if they want one. And there's why would you spend a thousand bucks on this thing? It's like stupid. There's no reason to spend a thousand bucks on it, but I might make, you know, a few of them because I want one and I want a really big one as well. So I looked into it today. I, I sent a couple of mails to a couple of, uh, um, uh, engineers in a couple of companies that I'm working with. And I said, Hey, I got this crazy idea. Can you help me build it? And so far everybody's like, I don't get it. And I was like, yes, but when you do, and the whole idea with it is it's an instrument that um, uh, a resonome sounds like something you'd encounter on DMT. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> Someone says, why wouldn't you? I bought a fucking paper plate for 40 bucks from you. Well, thanks for that. Hey, those paper plates, that was a funny thing. Um, thank you for that. We, uh, I was on tour uh, before I went and did the empath thing. I didn't want to go on tour, so... Uh, my friends in the band Avatar said, you know, you can, if you want to come along with this, you could do your acoustic thing and you get, you know, some decent money and whatever. And we had no merch, couldn't get the merch in town. So I just did a bunch of pictures on paper plates and, and that guy bought one of them. So thanks, man. All right. But yeah, the resonome. So I don't know. Should I, uh. Should I explain what it is? Do you want to hear what it is? Or is that going to be like... Don't steal my idea, though, because it's wicked. <laughs> okay. 
So, so I'm going to talk to Framus about making the enclosure, and I'm going to get three or four different enclosures. And it's, uh, uh, I don't want to talk about it yet. It's too awesome. It's too awesome. And I want to figure it out first. So next time, next time, I promise that I'll have, di well, actually, I, di I did a diagram of it. Let me see if I have the diagram. I can do that at least. Uh, let's see, the resin. Okay, so that's what it currently is. So there's your resin. But we'll get it. How does it sound? It sounds like celestial beauty that you can make any sound any sound that you produce whether or not it's with your phone or with your voice or you plug in a guitar or whatever will create just celestial random harmonic madness that is in clouds and clouds of goo and there's lights so resonant all right i don't know how i got on that but i did because that's just the type of monotasking cat I am that oh it's because of the ghost 2 question that explains why I didn't get to ghost 2 because I probably had some sort of resonating gnome idea at that time and it sort of distracted me all right okay so let's see what's next um your lineup rotates these days how come uh, I don't like being in a band I hate being in a band but I like new relationships because then all the the um the drama that comes with being in a band just you know you're in that sort of honeymoon phase for a while and i i love that and there's probably some people who would be critical of that saying well you know what comes from uh the the struggle of of learning how to deal with with others is a lot of where the inspiration comes musically however i would counter that by saying i i have such a strong vision for what i want to do and because i like being friends with people I have a hard time telling people exactly what I feel about their trip without coming across like a dick. Like, there's often that sort of, hey, just tell me what you feel. Like, tell me the truth about it. But my standards are so high for players that it's never right. It's never right. No matter who it is, it's never right. And if that was how I approached every time I was asked, how did you feel about that performance? If I just said, hey, it's not right. <laughs> it's never right. It just sucks. And then after a while, you start to get used to people and you start to get used to what their playing styles are like. And I just, I um, really enjoy improvising with people. And so when musicians who are new in my world present me with a bunch of new things, um, it's really easy for me to be inspired by that. Like if somebody plays a fill or a bass lick that I've never heard, I, I, I'm like, oh, that's awesome. I'm not bored of that yet. So we could take that in this direction or we could do this, we could do that. And on a social level, I want to maintain a relationship with people that's friendly. I like being friends with people, but I have to be in charge of this stuff. I tried on a number of occasions to like interpret the music differently. And I mean, to a certain extent it works, but uh, I like just saying, do it like this, do it like this, do it like this. And, and so having new people uh, involved allows me to uh, get away with that without being viewed as a tyrant, I guess. <laughs> All right. How much do you miss standing on the stage and having a blast? I'm going to look at those as two mutually, mutually exclusive things. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, and I've been asked this. And I get mails. I think the hardest part about the amount of work that I'm doing right now, I mean, I'm up at seven every day and I, you know, finish work at midnight every day. It's just huge amounts of work, huge amounts of work. And I'm so fortunate to be in a position where I, I'm able to do this during this uh, situation. Thank you for allowing that to happen, like for real. But there's a lot of musicians that aren't faring that well. And I feel terrible for them. But at the same time, what I don't feel terrible about is they all text me. Like my buddies who are in bands, they just have these long, endless text conversations because they're bored. So as I'm working, I'll just be like, ah, ding, 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 ding. And, um, and I'm just like, oh my God. And what that underlines to me is there's some people who love the idea of the touring environment. Uh, there's people who I, I know who are, I did an interview for a magazine the other day that were bummed out when I said I was doing okay, not touring. They're just like, I think they had some sort of a, some sort of a, uh, a narrative that, that, um, I was supposed to fit into and just be like, oh, I, I hate not being on tour. I, 
I hate being around my family. I hate working on my music every day. This is like the worst. But in fact, I, <laughs> I'm doing all right, man. <laughs> I, uh, I feel that the, um, I feel that the, uh, uh, someone says I need to hit the do not disturb button. Yeah, but a lot of these people are friends too. So it's not that I'm irritated by them. I'm just irritated by the volume of, 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 uh, texts, right. Or mails. And, you know, it's funny too. A lot of times, you know, you're getting memes from people, you know, dudes with big cocks or whatever. And, uh, you know, that one that everybody's getting, you know, I get that one like three or four times a day. It's like, oh, it's on a light switch. It's funny. Yeah, it's true. Um, I, think touring and playing live is just a necessary evil for my career the part of touring and playing live i like is is being in front of the people who support it i feel that that is really important and i i that's why i get so upset at myself when my voice doesn't work or whatever because it's like you want to provide that for people you know you're trying to make it the best it can be and give people a good moment and and whatever and for that reason i will tour until i can no longer tour physically but man the touring life, you know, the whole like after show party and everybody's hammered in the bus and, you know, and we're going to go to some shitty disco at like two o'clock in the morning. I just, I couldn't care less. I couldn't care less. So when I'm on tour, it's just often like, well, where do I find something to eat? When is the show? And how soon can I have a bath so I can go to bed? So being, uh, being back, uh, at home or in Vancouver, at least where I can do my work, I'm just like taking so, I'm taking the most advantage of this as I can. I'm like, I got a ton of things I want to do, a ton of things I want to finish. Um, I feel that from this vantage point, I can provide some, in the ways that a musician can, some sort of relief for the audience. And so I want to keep providing that, keep providing it, keep providing it, keep providing it. And as much work as it is, I, 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 I find myself, I flourish in this environment where I'm able to just constantly create. Um, and live is really like, man, I never really wanted to go on tour. Even as a kid, you know, you see all those Motley Crue and Rat videos and I was never like, that's what I want to do. You know, I want to snort worms and like be with a bunch of groupies or something. I was like, no, I'm already married. I don't want to snort a worm. I just want to play my stuff. And if people like it, that's awesome. But man, the touring life. So how much do I miss being on stage? Uh, only in the sense that I miss the audience, but, uh, you know, as I'm editing this DVD too, one thing that has been um, woefully apparent to me is uh, I feel that, and I've said this a bunch of times, that musicians are conduits for music. I don't think that any musician or artist is like the creator of it. I think you're just privy to a collective unconscious and then through your filter you end up interpreting these experiences in ways that other people are like oh with that particular sheen on it i relate to that sentiment because it's more universal so i don't consider the act of being a musician more than you're just you know you're you're privileged to do it and you want to honor the source you want to honor what music is and uh i was mastering this dvd yesterday and the mastering engineer is a friend of mine says says how's it going i'm like dude i hate listening to my fucking banter i hate listening to what i say between the songs it's just it's it compounds the stress of the project when you're just like fuck that guy and he's like oh people really like that banter because it it it's like it's a human thing and i'm like yeah but man let me tell you my estimation of this process is that as someone who's trying to honor the music i'm just trying to get myself out of the way so a lot of that sort of overcompensation and that insecurity that seems to be apparent in my uh, live talk a lot of the times, I personally am just like, oh, dude, what the fuck? I cut uh, 25 minutes of talking out of the DVD because that night was hard because it was the election and everybody was like bummed on the crew and in the audience. And so I overcompensated and I just talked like, you know, like every word was going to uh, take one life off of the amount of rebirth <laughs> yay that is uh fucking that is uh a very strange thing to bring up wow so uh but i cut out a whole bunch of that because i was just like dude just stop talking and play the music but there we go all right so ever planned on making an eventual z2 or not planning to revise that 
or Z3. Oh, there's my glasses. We're not planning to revise that. Uh, release a Just a Banter album. Oh, God. Oh, my God. No, man. No, man. I do my best to just... When the music is good, when I feel like I've hit that mark with the music, it's because I'm not in it. That's the whole thing. The, the part of the music that bugs me is when I'm like, oh, there's Dev in there, you know? Uh, Z3... I've got a folder on one of my computer drives that says Z3 that has a couple of ideas, but until such time, same with all the other thing uh, that we've talked about here, until such time that I feel compelled to make a Ziltoid record, I, there's no reason to do it. In fact, I kind of fucked over some buddies of mine that were making a video game. They were making a Ziltoid video game in Sweden for me. And we were all going, and they wanted to do all this music, and I was super into it, and then I just got bored of it. And... One could say, well, dude, just suck it up and do it anyway. But at the same time, there's no reason for the audience to spend money on artists now at all. What's the reason for you guys to spend money on, on art? There's no reason. I mean, it's all free if you want it. It's like YouTube and Spotify and you don't have to pay. It. So the only reason that people provide money to artists is because they want them to continue. That's how I feel about it, at least. So if people are going to purchase something that I've done I want to make sure that it's the best it can be and the way it can be the best it can be for me is if my heart's in it so if I get bored of something a lot of times I just feel like oh shit now I'm bored of it uh oh how do I explain this to everybody <laughs> or conversely I'll come up with an idea that I think is really compelling that doesn't make any sense in terms of a business trajectory casualties of cool was a great example of that I remember when that was finished listening to it going oh great it's reasonably perfect it's it's how i wanted it to be and then my next thought was like how am i going to explain this one to people how am i going to explain this to the management or the label it's like well i know that we did epic cloud and it was a bunch of you know sort of pop metal type songs but now i want to do spooky country music so good luck so there's that so z3 if it i don't know maybe i says someone says ah, i love cock Oh, wait, no. Casualties of cool. <laughs> Nothing wrong with spooky. All right. What is Annika singing in the song Secret Sciences? Oh, I have no idea. How's that song go? Hey. I don't know. I don't know. It was probably something to do with traveling, though, because that whole song was written about Heathrow. If you listen to the song Secret Sciences, I tried to... It, the, the licks and the whole atmosphere of that song reminded me of, I think it was Terminal 5 or Terminal 3 on a rainy day. So I think I probably asked Annie to sing something that, that referred to travel. All right. All right. So this is not a question. It says, holy fucking shit. Yes, I was literally just thinking about that today. In regards to what that is referring to, I have no idea, but I like saying it. So there was that. All right. So. Mm. Any advice on how to finish one project or idea through to the end and not quit partway through due to a sudden lack of enthusiasm or being distracted by something else? <laughs> That's what I was just saying that I'm not good at. However, I will refine that statement by saying that I will only abandon temporarily or, or however so much an idea based on um, me getting bored with it, if it's still in the uh, creative uh, gestation period. Because once it gets past that, once I've committed to something, I'm really good at finishing it. And that process, which I can uh, elaborate on, is much more about um, the other side of your brain. So oftentimes people say, hey, uh, writing and simultaneously producing yourself is something that uh, is difficult because it requires you to sort of think in two ways at the same time. And I agree with that. But if you can relegate your creative process to uh, either end. So I'll give a practical example. When I'm writing, my Pro Tools session is just a gong show. It's just there's a sub bass track right below a choir track and the second choir track is way up by the kick drums because I just go quick and I drag and drop it and I move things around. It's like super chaotic. But then once I'm able to sit back from it, at the end of each time I make a song, I'll, I'll mail myself an MP3 of an idea 
then I can hear it in the car or what have you. And once I've determined that that idea is worthy of pursuit, like it's it's creatively, intellectually, uh, spiritually, whatever, significant to me, uh, then that creative side of my brain, I can sort of say, okay, now that needs to be put on hold for a while. And at that point, uh, and the process, I think, is just shifting your perspective prior to opening the session. I'm like, okay, now we're going to view this from the other side of my mind. And then I open it up. And then that more logistic side of my, my personality is like, okay, so let's organize this session. Let's make sure that all the file management is in the right place. Let's make sure that it's color coordinated in the right ways. All the tracks are in these, in these areas. And then by doing that, um, I can relegate my production slash mixing slash mastering mind to the technical sides of it and completely ignore on a lot of levels that um, creative side. So in order to answer your question about how do you finish it, um, learning that technique of being able to sort of um, separate your creative uh, inclinations from your technical inclinations. And there's a lot of ways that you can foster that skill. I think um, anything that is a discipline, you know, like martial arts or meditation or eating a certain thing or, you know, vegetarianism or whatever. I think that the process of, of, uh, denying yourself that that tendency to just say, okay, well, I'm going to give in to that temptation to to not finish or whatever, is uh, cultivated in any uh, realm that that uh, promotes disciplinary thinking. Uh, failure is something to try to drive. Oh, these move so quick. Uh, okay. All right. Someone's Ray Charles was online. Oh no. <laughs> better way to do it with heart good things are done through time i agree with that so i've got a lot of projects that i'm working on but they're all kind of like slow motion apocalypse right like over time they happen and even this dvd this roundhouse dvd i started mixing it prior to the north american ill-fated tour so i've been working on this project for for months and now it's just finishing up i got to take it slow you know okay so let's see what's next here did you really post underwear wrapped demo tapes about to get noticed in the industry? Yes, I did. I think that um, the uh, scatological nature of what has always struck me as being funny uh, probably stems back to Monty Python on some level. I just always like, you know, a good bathroom joke. But it's not because I'm obsessed yes. scatologically. Thank you for the donation. Um, I, you know, people, I've, I've had people come up to me that say, oh, I know that you like fart jokes. So you want to see my poo or something? I'm like, no, dude, I don't really like poop, but I think farts are funny. I mean, there it is. Right. So, um, when I first started, I had made the noisecapes demo and I had been given by a colleague a list of record label addresses and their a and r person's names. Um, it was a guy that worked at a radio station. He said, well, here's this. And so I figured, okay, well, knowing in my experience of, of being at a label and seeing these bags and bags of demo tapes back in the 80s and 90s coming through that the a and r guy just doesn't pay any attention to, any attention to. I was like, well, how do you get attention for this? So I just, I gaff taped my, um, my demo tape to the crotch of my old burnt out underpants with a, with a promo photo inside. And it wasn't again to be like, Hey, by the way, here I really like poop. It was just like, Oh, I thought that'd be funny. And it worked. A bunch of these labels ended up um, writing back and they're just like, why did you send me your underwear? And I was like, well, so that you would notice. And you did. So there it was. And here I am today. 50 year old man talking about poop. All right. So what's next? How to stay passionate about music. I fear I'm losing it. Well, here's my thought on that. I wonder, and I don't know, this might be, uh, this might be an unpopular thought, but I wonder if maybe the goal of being a musician is to run out of things to write about. You know, I think that, uh, I've often wondered, even for myself, when people are like, well, why don't you go back to doing your old bands again? Why don't you go back to this style of music that you did again? And I'm not just talking about strapping. I'm talking about anything. Why don't you do Ziltoid again? Why don't you do 
something like Addicted again? Why don't you do City again? And as opposed to just resenting it, I think to myself, why can't you? Okay, give it some thought. Why can't you? And it's not why won't you, but why can't you? And I think that for me, my trajectory as a musician is more rooted in trying to figure myself out. And once I figure something out, I'm like, okay, well, that was the byproduct of that particular uh, function slash dysfunction, whatever you want to call it. And I learned what I need to learn from that. And there's, there's um, there's the document of it. And not only would I be incapable of, of like accessing that again, because I'm over it. I know what that function was, um, entail in it. Uh, it's just like, okay, so next, 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 next to the point where I start thinking, well, what happens when you get to the point where you've got yourself in a sense where you're, um, uh, you know, you feel like maybe you're you're always going to be angry or upset or whatever, but maybe you're yes. more centered than you were before. So what do you write about? What do you write about? Thank you for the donation. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, and maybe that's the whole goal. You get to the point where you're just like, I'm done. I'm done. Maybe that's a goal of being a human being. I think a lot of, I think a lot of what we're sold as a Western society is that success, bigger, better, more, is the objective. And I've been working with some musicians lately, and, and one guy had said, you know, if you do this and this and this, you could take this so much further. And I was like, I don't want to take it further. That sounds horrible to me. I'm able to be completely creatively free. I've got a great audience. Um, you're a, What a great audience. Um, I'm not recognized. It's like I get a free guitar every now and then. This is perfect. I don't want to be a star. That sounds fucking horrible. It sounds horrible. So I think it's like, uh, uh, what the hell was I talking about? A boot. I think we're talking about how do you get, what do you do when you've lost the will to make music? I think you should be proud of yourself. That's how I feel. And then maybe there's other things in life that are just, going to call you next that are way more appropriate because a lot of times I still I struggle with the idea of monetizing what I do for a number of reasons but one is because it always seems like true art why do you need other people to see it or hear it like why do you need it it's like it seems like on some level the only reason that you would like sell things to people is because you still need like that approval and I mean now it's a little different because I got you know, family and, and bills and all that stuff. And I love doing it. So there's that too. But I think that um, the whole thing that we're sold about fame is just so gross, man. How are you handling social media? There's so much going on, increasingly difficult taking all this uh, information and stay sane. Um, well, again, my whole trip and what I'm hoping to provide with what I do is to not compound people's shit. I mean, if people put overtly racist things and tag me on it, they can go fuck themselves. You know what I mean? But in terms of, um, you know, uh, any sort of scene or any sort of political affiliations or I'm just not particularly informed and I just don't. I just don't, I think that people got enough of that, man. Everybody's angry. Everybody's pissed off. I could put up on social media, hey, guys, I really like the color puce. And there would be, you know, people saying, I can't believe that you, you said that. I can't believe that you like puce. Didn't realize you were a pucist. And so I tend to just avoid um, uh, anything on social media that is going to just make things worse for people. I mean, of course I've got opinions. Of course, I'm a human being, right? But my my job and how I think the work that I do functions best is when I'm helping and not just like compounding everybody's day with, you know, another person's shit, you know? I don't know. I don't know. It's hard because I try and be um, uh, present with a bunch of different opinions. Like, I've got a bunch of people in my life who are on all different sides of the fence, not even just politically, but like in terms of 
any sort of debate or conspiracies or any sort of these things. And I want to be able to, within reason, just say, okay, well, tell me why I don't understand. Tell me why. And I think that sort of dialogue is, like, super healthy when it's not based in just, like, fuck you, you're an idiot, but more just, like, well, tell me why I don't understand. And I find that I learn different things all the time. But, again, my role is I want to make music and I want to play shows and I want people to be like, hey, that was fucking badass. It's a great song, you know? And I think... uh, 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 it's not that I. It's not that I don't feel the the that the weight of of a lot of these conversations that are going on. Of course I do. Oh my God, it's in my life as much as it is in everybody else's. But what can I do about it? I can play music. I can try and provide something that makes people feel better. I can make some floaty guitar sounds. I can play some metal. I can make some records. That's what I bring to the table. And I think my intention and who I am is going to shine through no matter what I do. Specifically, if going back to the beginning of this conversation, my, um, my reasons for doing anything is because I'm emotionally invested in it. There's no way you're not going to know what my trip is by listening to what I do. There's no way. So, you know. So here's this guitar. This is great. So I'm a famous guy through and through. They're just perfect for me. But... Some of these guitar companies recently have been like, hey, do you want to try one of our guitars? And I was like, absolutely. And this one here, this Aristides thing is like this crazy, dude, this thing's, <laughs> this thing's awesome, right? And I like the color too. Makes me feel like writing summary music, right? <laughs> okay. I missed out a chunk of this because my nine-year-old niece keeps sending me her favorite horror clips. Wow, dude. <laughs> okay, so next question. Yeah, I love the color of this too. Okay. Pop punk has be was becoming big when you made Punky Brewster. Do you see yourself making another album, making fun of another genre, or is that ship sailed long ago? Man, I used to be brutal with like bagging on people and just you know being you know super caustic towards things. I was actually talking to a good friend of mine yesterday about that because we used to. We used to call each other up and just revel in like being dicks about things. Like we would just give people the gears constantly. And just we were just roasting people, roasting people, roasting people. But something changed over the years where it became clear to me that, you know, if you don't want to have your life surrounded by that shit, you just don't do it. It's as simple as that. And there's no right or wrong. It's just like, well, listen, if you, if you, if you're okay with this particular energy being a part of your life, then you can pursue that. But if you're trying to change it, there's another uh, sort of creative avenue that you're going to have to pursue uh, to to find a, a, a path out of that. And roasting people, uh, as much as I used to be really good at it, I just... I just found it. I ended up hurting a bunch of people's feelings, and I just, it doesn't help. I don't hurt people's feelings. You know what I mean? At least, at least unprovoked, right? And so when it comes to roasting other types of music, I'm just like, damn, man. I'm fairly roastable myself, so I think you're kind of opening yourself up for stuff like that. So I got no idea, really. Oh, this is how I make that ambient stuff, by the way, like the ambient guitar thing. I've got this patch that is just like 100% echo, and so I just basically. That's it. And then I just add notes by fading it in. Right? That's how I do that, by the way. All right, so what's next? My real question, is it more of a challenge to write heavier stuff without the the reserve of aggression you used to have? This is a great question. And one that there will be people who... uh, will never understand and I have to and I I believe to a certain extent I have uh, just accept that you know I can say hey man this is my this is my reasonably well thought out argument as to why I don't want to do this and then someone will be like oh cool okay so when are you going to do it and I used to be like wow maybe I'm not explaining myself right as opposed to like oh you guys just a knucklehead fuck them but um, the way I feel about heavy music now is I'm just not particularly into it anymore however and this is, I think, how it's different from other 
maybe metal musicians that age and are just like, now I'm not going to play that anymore. Uh, the music that I did in the past, all the strapping, all DTP, all that stuff, it's what has allowed me to do this. And I honor that completely. I love it. I love the fact that all the things that I had to do in the past to get me where I'm at now, they don't disappear. It's not like I can just say, okay, well, that part of my life no longer exists. It's like, no, man, this is, that was you then. So when it comes to playing that stuff, I don't want to put strap back together. Fuck no. I don't want to put DTB back together. Fuck no. I want to do something else. And what I'm doing next is it keeps getting less heavy. So, you know, spoiler alert, if you're waiting for me to do another brutal record, I mean, it's not going to happen. I'm just not interested in it. However, it doesn't mean that I'm not going to play heavy stuff. I'm happy to play heavy stuff. Why? Because the people who support me like it. There you go. So I'm doing uh, this this next green screen concert um, that goes up for sale later this week. It's Man, okay. Here's the thing about this next concert. It's the buy request set from Bloodstock. Um, it's like half strapping, half DTP. It's... Dude, there's so much where it sounds so fucking good. We did it live by... So Sam has recorded his drums while filming himself. Sent me the tapes. I recorded myself live while listening to him recording live. Then I sent it to Wes. He recorded himself live while listening to everybody else. He sent it to Liam. He recorded himself live. I take all that material. I mix it. And then we've got the same company that made the Spirits Will Collide video. They're making a virtual stage with eight different camera angles that they put us together as a virtual band. And it's like, it's like badass. <laughs> How do the guys uh, uh, from DTP feel about you not wanting to be in that band anymore? Not good. Same as the strapping guys. What, let me ask you this. What are you supposed to do? This is what Empath was about. This is exactly what Empath was about. On some level, I feel that a lot of my life has been spent people-pleasing. I've spent a lot of my time making decisions on behalf of something that I do, the majority of the writing, the major all the recording, all the mixing, everything. It's me. But I make decisions on that based on not wanting to make other people unhappy. And I've done that for many years, and that led to a terrible breakup with strapping. Because I couldn't just say, guys, I'm over it, I want to do something else. So I just ended up pussyfooting around it and just, like, making a mess of it. With DTP, it was better. I was able to say, guys, I don't want to do this anymore, and that's it. Here's a couple months worth of severance pay, and I'm going to go do something else. But the biggest thing that I felt needed to be represented musically for me during the empath period was, you need to be strong enough to make a decision for yourself that may not be popular with others especially people who you care about i mean ryan beave dave mike I, I just, these are people that i care about greatly but i needed to do it for myself i just wasn't satisfied musically anymore so i made that decision and it was very difficult like specifically when i've spent a lot of my life um also trying to deal with like self-loathing like how do you not like resent yourself and how do you not harp on mistakes you've made in the past for being um you know low i fucked up or i hurt somebody or whatever i mean sometimes in life you've got to make decisions that are not going to be popular and i think if you spend all your time avoiding those decisions you're not going to grow you're just going to end up stagnating and that's what i started finding happening and what it required me to do was just to say this is how I feel. This is what I'm going to do. So when it comes to making heavy music again, you know what? I I'm, I've, I know that for the rest of my career, there's going to be people that uh, every time I do anything heavy, they're going to be like, he's going to do heavy. Ah, he's going to do it again. And uh, I'm not. That's like, I'm at 50, I'm just not as interested in it. I never, ever listen to metal anymore ever ever i might listen to it if my buddy's band is like hey what do you think of this mix but i'll be like you know i don't listen to it i haven't listened to it in years 
So my sphere of musical influence seems to be like changing to things that maybe the fan base that I've been so fortunate to have accumulated might not be as interested in as they once were. But I gotta do it. I gotta do it. I gotta do it. However, that doesn't mean that I'm not going to try and make um, some sort of concession and say, listen, what do you want to hear? What do you want to hear from City? What do you want to hear from Alien? What do you want to hear from Sinkestra? What do you want to hear from Infinity? I'm happy to play. Yes. But I certainly don't want to go back in time. I certainly don't want to put together a band that had a lot of dysfunction that at the time was just like not conducive to growth for me. But again, it's like, you know, I love Gene. I love Jed. I love Byron. I love Beave. I love Ryan. I love Dave. I love, I love all these guys, man. I'll tell you what I really like. I like just doing whatever the fuck I want to do. And that's what I'm doing. And it's awesome. And thank you so much for allowing me to do it. <laughs> All right. Will the, will the virtual set be set on Earth in a classic theatrical way? Or out in the universe? What do you think? Of course it's in the universe, man. On Earth? I actually talked to the guys who were doing the virtual concert, and I said, can we make it on a platform with a big middle finger flying away from Earth? <laughs> we'll see. Um, the show is going to be its going to be 25 bucks. i am sorry about that. Um, but it's 85 minutes, and I'll be there live with you as well at the green screen studio. Um, but it has cost me so far 25000 bucks to make. So... I have to charge for it. Sorry. But I'm sure it'll be online. I'm sure it'll be on YouTube like three or four days after. I can't imagine someone's not going to film it and put it up. But uh, it would be great to recuperate that at this time. But it was also one of these things where when the label and the management were just like, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, listen, I want to spend a shitload of money making this crazy show. But I also feel that it was important for me for it to be awesome. If I'm going to play that material, you know, it's going to be like the best of... Uh, set. If it's going to have the strapping stuff, uh, I want to honor it because I don't want to do it with the old bands. I just don't because then it's going to set a precedent. But if I'm going to do it with other people, I want it to be perfect. And so it was. But it was also super expensive. So come if you can. I need to have, I think at least with all the stage it fees and management fees and everything, I think I have to have at least 1,500 people to break even. But even if it doesn't, fuck it. It's so badass, man. <laughs> um, holy shit, I made it here. Devin, you are the man. Indica Switch, as are you. All right. Let's see what else we got. More questions. Are there any songs of yours or others that you weren't happy with at the time that you've grown to appreciate? I think the weirdest thing about making records is that you don't know at the time what's a good song or not. Well, I think you know it's a good song, but a lot of times um, I'll make a record and I'll think every one of these songs is a winner. And then 10 years down the line, you're like, all I remember is this one or two songs, you know? Um, so I think that uh, for me, there's a certain amount of, of every record that's just unknown. You're like, I don't know if this is good, but it appeals to me right now. And that's the criteria that I use more than anything else, right? What type of music do you consider Hear Me to be? Hear Me is a throwback to strapping. But it's still, that's like, that was one moment. I was able to sort of conjure that up in the middle of singularity and everything. And that was cool. I enjoyed that. But at the same time, it's like, I wrote Hear Me four years before Empath? 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 And uh, it, it just was one of these things where after I wrote it, I was like, oh, shit. Where'd that come from? And then I was exhausted for a week. So I think that um, my long-term recording process, where I'll, like I've got songs on my hard drives that are 20 years old that I haven't released yet because I'm just slowly working them. And then when they start to all of a sudden come into light as being, well, this is appropriate to where my head's at now, I might find, oh, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated. I need a song that sounds frustrated to fill this particular moment of this record. And then I'll go through the drives, and there may be something from uh, years ago that's cool. Someone says, I think the heaviest song you've made is Pandemic. Yeah, it was a heavy one, too, specifically uh, considering these particular times. 
But I mean, I think the thing is as well, every now and then, yeah, I write heavy stuff. Yeah. That's awesome. But, man, I, I just uh, don't hold your breath for a, a completely heavy record because I just don't listen to it anymore. Really. So, someone's just like, well, am I going to listen to it anymore? Well, that's probably good for both of us to know. All right, so, if you love cats, get on Instagram and look at my babies. All right, let's look at this person's cats. All right, here we go. So, whoa, pink pie cats. Yeah, tell me, that's a good cat, right? Let's see what else we got on pink pie cats. Mm, I'll find the best one on pink pie cats. Clearly... Clearly this one. What do you think? No? There we go. <laughs> Glad he wasn't talking about his balls. Yep. All right. So. You guys been doing all right throughout all this crap? No? Yes. Going forward, we should call you moderately heavy, Debbie. I think that makes more sense. <laughs> well, sometimes it's heavy, though. And again, does it make sense to you guys that... Um, a lot of my peer group, as they get older, they're just like, I'm never playing heavy music again. That's it. No more heavy music. Um, and for me, I'm just like, yeah, I'll play it sometimes. Someone just said no. It said it doesn't make sense to them. That's totally cool. I don't know what to say other than it's the way it is. And it's not a choice as much as it's just like, this is what happens, man. And I guarantee as you get older, a lot of you will feel the same way. I'm worried about kids going back to school, someone says. If you could do a step-by-step -step explanation of how you uh, set up your guitar. Uh, reverb sound. Okay, so. I have an amp sim, which is usually like a Fender amp sim. And I go into like a 212 cab sim. And then... Um, I have the first delay set to an analog delay that has uh, maybe a thousand milliseconds, but at like 80% repeat and no high end on it. And then I make that mix 100%. And then I take that and then I put that into a reverb that's at about 60% that has a 10 second, maybe 15 second long swell. And then after that, I put a ping pong delay that's about 500 milliseconds. And then I put uh, no high end on that and I take the, the low end off of that as well. And then with the volume knob, um, you can either fade in notes or you just hit it like this, right? Nerd, someone says. Yes, it makes sense, thank you. It's not, you know, my whole trip is not gonna make sense to everybody, but you know, I guess the whole thing is it's like, uh, <laughs> then, uh, it's not going to make sense to everybody, but I don't care. I think that's healthy. And that's how I get my... Uh, has meditation had any impact on the way that you do your, your trip? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I think that when I was younger, I used to uh, try and find some sort of uh, sense of uh, connection to things that aren't just this bullshit human chaos that we're living through through drugs you know what I mean like I wanted to like take a bunch of psychedelic drugs or something and um, that just didn't do anything except for make me crazy at the time because I was misinterpreting all these things so I found that for me meditation requires me to sort of uh, challenge a lot of my preconceived notions and the more I do it the more I realize that a lot of what I had once sort of put a lot of stock into as being important is just not. <laughs> I think when I was younger, it was like you think, okay, well, money or fame or whatever will be clearly what will help you become satisfied or at peace with yourself. Because when you're exploding, like I remember when I think back to like City or Alien or whatever, I was exploding. I didn't want to feel that way. That was a horrible way to feel. It wasn't like, man, this is something, this is awesome. I should sustain this. 
I think if you are consciously trying to sustain that shit, you're just a masochist. And for me, I was just trying to find my way to not feel that way. Like, that was the goal, even back then. So now that I feel like, and I still, of course, I still get pissy pants, of course. But now that I'm feeling less that, even in the face of some relentless brutality, um, uh, you know, in terms of psychologically or, you know, these things that happen or just things on a personal level or whatever, um, to know that I'm not in that frame of mind anymore is, like, amazing. But I don't think that's something that could have been sustained just by, like, taking mushrooms every morning. I think it's something that I needed to figure out how to do with nothing. And so meditation's been good for me that way. But who knows? I'm probably full of shit. Actually, I know I am. But uh, let's see. Have you heard of Hypa Hypa? No. Why did you choose to cut Gulag from the album? Okay. Um, when I make bonus tracks, the bonus tracks... Okay, I guess the best way for me to explain it is to explain how I make a record in general. I just always record. Always record. I've got tons and tons of material that I've recorded over the past couple of months even. Like, finished tracks. But I finish them because to not finish a song, and who, those of you who are musicians will probably relate to this, to not finish a song, it, just, it takes up this psychological real estate of my creative mind that is best relegated to other things. But if I finish it, no matter whether or not I like it or I don't like it or if it's stupid or whatever, if I just get it out, then that real estate opens up again for something new. So what tends to happen is I record a ton of material and a lot of it I, I like. But then as a record starts nearing its, its um, deadline, it starts to become clear to me what the record was subconsciously hinting at and what I mean by that is when I'm starting writing a record little hints start to come to me I start thinking oh I'm I'm interested in um, I'm interested in the color green I'm interested in the beach I'm interested in these like sort of um, very very sort of subtle interests start to appear as you know as you change as you get through life at some period maybe you're into gi joes and then when you were 18 maybe you're into metallica or whatever like all these sort of subconscious clues i call them as to what that particular period of time for me seems to entail i just end up sort of documenting it's almost like a collage and then by the time i get to the end of it i've got a ton of songs finished i've got a ton of psychological um, uh, sort of um, windows into what that particular period of time meant to me and then towards the end it gets summarized sometimes by a name Teria, whatever Sincestra, Alien, whatever and then when I am able to sort of put all those pieces of the collage together at the end I'm like, oh the record is about this Empath is about midlife and chart of making stock, taking stock of where you've been, and then making a dynamic record that allows me to have an emotional trajectory throughout it that is meant to sort of represent a transition from one place to another. But then when that started happening, I was like, okay, well, this song works and this song doesn't. Doesn't mean that that song's better or worse. Doesn't mean that that song is better or worse for the audience specifically. But for me, which if I haven't been clear about it, is my objective creatively. If we're not clear about that now, then I don't know if we're paying attention. And at that point, I was like, for me, that song doesn't suit that trajectory. I don't think it's a bad song, but I'll include it on the other thing. So that's it. Please play something. Well, I'm playing something, but I don't really feel like performing today. But I tell you what, because I've got, what time is it now? It's 1257. I've got to, I've just been delivered, I see, the DVD of the Roundhouse. So I've got today to finish that. I've got to start the 5.1 and I've got to do a bunch of, ton, I got to do a ton of shit. I've got about two and a half weeks worth of chaos before I can actually go. The next Twitch stream that I do, I will do a by request set for you all. And I will sing and play whatever you want. Is that a deal? Can we do that? Would that be all right? Let's see. 
Sweet, someone says. I'm going to take that one. Charity concerts. Yes, so um, I've got three more concerts coming up. But if you're following me on, on, uh, on Twitter, it'll be easier for me to uh, explain that as opposed to explaining it again here. So let's see. Sounds good. Would an hour of ambient music be suitable? It would be for me, but probably not for most people. <laughs> I think, wouldn't that be funny? Actually, if that's just what I end up doing, if I just end up being like some floaty dude that have a bunch of um, prior metalheads resenting me for, I'd be okay with that. But currently, that's not where it's at either. It's a part of what I do, but it's also not all that I do. I think that what I learn more and more as I get older is that in order to be well-rounded as a musician, as an individual, it's a bit of everything. It's a bit of brutal, it's a bit of mellow, it's a bit of funny, it's a bit of orchestral, it's a bit of ambient. It's like, that's what it is. Every day is different. Life's like a box of chocolates, folks. Never know what you're going to do with the thing. So I've got to get back to work. I've got to edit this DVD. I've got a huge day of chaos. And uh, the texts just keep coming in. But um, I want you to know that uh, I appreciate so much the ability to do this. I appreciate so much the fact that during this time when money is tight for everybody, you guys are uh, supporting me and my work because it allows me to continue. And I think that's a two-way street. I'm not going to just take that and say, okay, that's it. I'm only going to do ambient music now. I'll do I play what makes people happy. Absolutely. Uh, as a person, though, I can't really control the directions that I go. And it seems like a lot of the directions that I'm going are like... <laughs> Floaty Seafoam Green Dev. But I think the people who care about me the most, you know, in my life, look at the, the, um, the moves that I've made in my world from being like super self-destructive dev to like hey i'm doing all right dev and they're just like fucking right on brother i don't think there's many people who truly care about me that are just like yeah dude you should go destroy yourself again that'd be, that'd be fucking great for us <laughs> so you need something to listen to and the guitar things have been great yeah i uh guitar stuff the ambient guitar stuff's cool but it's just you know it's just something i'm doing on the side it's not like this is my new direction but I'll be announcing this green screen thing. It's a lot of heavy, a lot of the past. It's really awesome. It's 25 bucks. That sucks because I know it's expensive, but it's like, I think it's worth it. And if it isn't, eh, don't go. Anyway, you guys are awesome, and I really appreciate everything that allows me to do this. I mean that. I can't say it enough. And I think, maybe I'll just finish by saying this. For the people who've been following me for all these years and know what I'm truly about, I don't think that I don't think that those people would want me to not do what it is that was compelling for me to do. The thing that was compelling for me to do when I was 21 was something that's much different than when I'm 48. But uh, I'm going to follow that road until until I'm no longer here. And at the end of it, I'll be like, yeah, that was that was me. That's where I was. I love you guys. Thank you so much. And I really, really appreciate the ability to do this. All right. Wait, I've got a... Wait, a, is this a be, be right back scene? Yeah, let me see. See how cheesy this is. Wait. Oh, that sucked. There's, there's got to be an ending scene. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. I'll see you in two weeks on Twitch. I'll do uh, by request in here whatever you want we'll figure it out uh i'll let you know about all these upcoming things thank you so much fish eye lens <laughs> uh, 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 uh. have a good day take care of yourself ending scene watch this <laughs>